Hello there. In today's video, I'm going to take a look at the Form CA24. Form CA24 is also known as the Inland Revenue Affidavit. When you want to obtain a grant of representation, be that a grant of probate or a grant of letters in test state, where a person may die without having made a will, you need to fill out an Inland Revenue Affidavit Form CA24. Now the first thing you need to understand, and you can see it on the screen there, is that there's actually a guide online on the Revenue website called a CA25, and it will help you go through section by section and answer questions in relation to the completion of this form. I'll go through now it anyway, just it may be of use, maybe of benefit to you. And the bottom line is, it is basically a form, an affidavit that must be sworn by the person seeking to become the executor or the representative of the deceased person. So the person who is making the application, this application to the probate office must fill out this form accurately and fully. Now that's the first thing that you need to understand. You must fill it out fully. And if there's any boxes, any questions, any parts or sections that are not answered by you, the form will be rejected by the probate office and will come back to you. So it is something that I cannot emphasize enough. You must fill out and answer all questions. Now, helpfully, the questions are actually numbered. So you really do need to make your way through the form as best you can following one number after the other and ensuring that you fill out as best you can every piece of information that's being sought. Because as I say, if it's not fully completed, it will be returned and it will obviously then delay you in getting your grant of representation. So the first section here, as you can see, part one is information relating to the deceased. So name and PPS number and address, date of death, date of birth, if known, and other personal information about the deceased person. So that needs to be filled out there. Then you have details of the person or the solicitor to be contacted in the event of any inquiry. So if you're doing it yourself, your details go in here. If a solicitor is doing it for you, then obviously the solicitor is going to fill out the details here. And this is what I do. I fill out the form for people when they're extracting a grant of representation or seeking to extract a grant. And my details would go in there. So that's page one. It's a long form though. I think there could be 24 pages or something in it. It is long, it's detailed, but it's not rocket science. It does have to be accurate though. Here, part two, we have details of the applicants. So the applicants are the people or the person who is seeking to extract a grant of representation. So if you were appointed as the executor or a joint executor, then your name will go in here and your occupation, your address, your relationship to the deceased. So you can see there, there's space for a number of applicants. So, you know, uh, there, there could be up four or five applicants. And if there's more required, you can probably put them in on a separate sheet of paper. But the normal situation is that there's one or two applicants because there's one or two executors named in the will or one person perhaps dealing with an intestacy. The person who's making the application then has to make an oath. So they're swearing that uh, the desire to obtain a grant of probate or administration with will or next or administration in test date, etc. And they're going to fill out their name here and they're going to have it sworn in front of a commissioner for oaths or a practicing solicitor. And uh, that's where the deponent or the applicant is going to put in their name. So that'll be you if you're going to a solicitor if you're doing it yourself, but even if you're uh, engaging the services of a solicitor, he's going to have you sign this application in front of a, another solicitor or a commissioner for oaths. So that's basically it on page two. Again, I can't emphasize enough that all forms or all boxes, rather all sections must be completed if they apply. Clearly, applicant two or applicant three is not going to apply if there's only one applicant. So that's the sworn declaration part of the statement. 
uh, and it is, as I say, an inland revenue affidavit. An affidavit is a sworn statement, so uh, this is the swearing part. And you're swearing essentially that you're looking for the grant of representation and you're swearing that the details that you've set out in the IT or the CA24 are correct. So here then you go through the various assets in the state of the deceased person. So property in the, in the state passing under the will or intestacy. So property would be the likes of a house or a field or a land or a farm or shop or whatever. So gross market value at the date of death. So you need a valuation there to give the gross market value at the date of death. You may also have household contents. You may have furniture, jewellery, antiques and so forth. Have a look through that. Set out the details here as best you can and the value if there is household contents. There may be cars or boats. There's probably almost certainly going to be a car. You need to put in the details there and the value. Then you have business assets that are not included elsewhere. So you'll have uh, farming assets perhaps, other business assets perhaps. Then here's the situation or here's the form or the part of the form where you deal with the bank accounts, building societies, credit union and so forth. So the assets would be set out here. Some of the assets, some of the financial assets, some of the accounts, for example, a credit union account may well fall outside the estate, but uh, it may you still need to disclose it here. So you have assets with various financial institutions. You're going to have the name and the branch and the account number and the amount. Again, you're carrying forward a gross value, market value at date of death of the estate here at all times. So this goes from one page to another and you carry it forward. Here's proceeds of life insurance policies. Here's debts owing to the deceased. Here's any stocks, shares or securities that were owned by the deceased. Here's any dividends accruing to the estate any unpaid purchase money that would be unusual a total of any other property not already included so the total gross irish estate will go in here and that will be carried forward there you see brought forward at all points on the form you're going to end up with a total gross irish estate then you're going to have the debts so you're going to have funeral expenses wake expenses headstone utilities amounts due to financial institutions and so forth You'll also have other debts, however. You may well have bank debts, you may have credit union debts, you may have debts to the revenue commissioners or wherever. So you're going to have total Irish debts. So obviously, if you have the total gross Irish estate and then you have the total Irish debts for the deceased person, then you're going to have the total net Irish estate. Then any other property that's not already included, you'd put in here, maybe to uh, further uh, houses, etc. Part five deals with property outside the state that's passing under the will. Sometimes assets outside the state, for example, an apartment in Spain or whatever, may well uh, pass uh, under the will or may pass outside the will. It depends on the particular country and what the situation is in that country in relation to passing of property on the death of the registered owner in Spain or in France or wherever. So that's something that you need to be careful about. So total gross foreign estate and foreign debts, total debts, total net foreign estate. So you then have the questionnaire here in relation to any Irish or property held jointly at the date of death. So again, you need to put in joint tenant or tenant in common if that's the situation and with whom it was held and what the relationship to the deceased was. Again, you need to work through all of these questions line by line and uh, answer them to the best of your ability because you will be swearing up to it. Again, full particulars of next property. This may not be relevant to you and if there's a house or a cottage or whatever and there's only one house, you've already dealt with it already in this form so you won't be even filling out this part of it. Um, so that's dealing with all the property then and as you go further down then you eventually get to the situation here's the sorry the situation in relation to anything that passed outside the will by way of a nomination for example when you open a credit union account you may nominate a person uh, as a beneficiary of that account on your passing away if that's the case then you're being asked here to identify did any person benefit on the debt of the deceased under a nomination at any time that would apply to a credit union account, but it also may apply to post office saving certs and post office um, accounts as well. 
Here's so, uh, questions in relation to superannuation schemes and policies of insurance and so on. Um, then was the deceased in receipt of any social welfare payments? You need to give the details there. You need to get the claim number and so on. Then whether the deceased was the owner of a limited interest, whether any person um, made by this take a gift or any other benefit in possession, etc., power of revocation, surrender. These are quite technical issues and te technical questions, but to be honest with you, they don't arise in the normal course, but you do need to be careful that this uh, f form is filled out as accurately as possible. Then you go down here to milk quota and timber. Again, it may or may not be relevant. As I say, you just enter the relevant information and then here you set out the information in relation to the particular property. So if it's a folio or registered property in County Meath or County Kildare or wherever, then you're going to put in the information here, leasehold, freehold, estimated market value of property and the registered, if registered, the folio number. Again, you do that for all, any other properties that may have been owned by the deceased or in which he may have had an interest or she had an interest. That's all the, what you're being asked for there. And then you're being asked here for the PPS number of the deceased. Then you're setting out here the beneficiary details. So who gets what? This is a summary, as you can see, summary of the benefits, including all current benefits exceeding 16,750. So you can exclude benefits taken by a spouse or civil partner and benefits that are less than 16750 um, don't have to be included. The beneficiary details then, you're going to need the PPS numbers, names and addresses of the various beneficiaries. You're also going to need to indicate what uh, group threshold they are in. So that will depend on the degree of relationship to the deceased person. If they're a stranger, if they're a son or a daughter, or if they're a nephew or niece. So that'll be A, B or C and that will determine then the group threshold will determine the tax exemption that they have in respect of any benefit. What will also be taken into account though is any previous or prior benefit that the beneficiary would have uh, received. So again you're setting out here all of the beneficiaries, there could be one or two, there could be 10 or 20 uh, and that's going to create a bit of work because you're going to have to write to them and get details of PPS numbers and so on and so forth. Well if you're a solicitor you're going to have to write to them. Um, beneficiary details then, that's continuing on all the beneficiaries and at the end of the day what you have then with this IT or the CA24 and the Inland, uh, Inland Revenue Affidavit is a setting out of everything that the deceased person owned and everything that they owed and who gets what arising from the death. And that will go in to the probate office along with some other documentation, for example, oath of executor and some other documents which are necessary to extract the grant of probate. This is a long form, it needs to be accurate, it needs to go in then uh, in duplicate as you can see there when completed this form in duplicate together with all other necessary documentation for a grant should be submitted to the probate office. So the other documents you're probably going to need a solicitor to help you with that but if you have a go at the Inland Revenue Affidavit yourself you can do a good bit of work and perhaps uh, assist your solicitor if you are getting a solicitor. If you're not that's fine you can do it yourself, uh, fire away. This form has to be accurate. It is basically a statement. It's a sworn statement. It's an affidavit and you'll be swearing up to it. Hope you find this video useful. If you do, you might give it a thumbs up down below.